the film had a certain kineticness. People have said you just don't get it. For so many years, this was, you know, this was, you were that guy. How did it end up in front of me? I want his head on this piano! I know the real samurai is here. As a film, it doesn't really have any strengths. I mean, the strength of this movie is that it's bad. The strength of the movie is that it's weak. There's a great overall feeling you get when you watch a movie like that and you kind of watch a, a film that is just coming undone with performances and direction and editing. And it, it's a really fascinating thing to kind of watch these movies and how they get made. And I think that's why people are so attracted to them is watching something that sh you know so many people have had their eyes on and then actually getting made. I think it fascinates people that it slips through the cracks and Samurai Cop is a perfect example of that. As a low-level exploitation film, I think that it's got some merits um, within that genre. Obviously, it has its flaws, but uh, there's a lot in here that was fun. Would you like to fuck me? Bingo. Well, then let's see what you've got. Doesn't interest me. Nothing there. Nothing there? Just exactly what would interest you? Something the size of a jumbo jet? Eight or nine years ago, there is the famous YouTube clip, uh, The Horny Nurse, which is a major part of the movie. And I think through that, people started asking questions and finding and, and wanting more. And then eventually there was more pieces on YouTube. And I think then the movie found a following and then eventually it was released. Listen, Joe. Hey Steve, how you doing? What's going on, Steve? Not much, sir. There's a nurse in there giving him an injection. Let's check it out. I have heard that there was a print found somewhere in a castle. I've heard those kind of lores, but I think, um, you know, mostly that this movie was found in a vault somewhere. I think the director who also did like a film called Hollywood Cop and, and, and um, you know, some other films that definitely match this kind of, of type of genre uh, had all of his films in a vault and I think that's how they were all discovered. So they call him Samurai, huh? Yes. His real name is Joe Marshall. Speaks fluent Japanese. Are you Fuji, Fujiyama? What does katana mean? It means Japanese sword. I just walked into his office and he's a short little portly Iranian guy and he's just like, you are it, you are the star of my movie. Uh, here's the script. Um, you are perfect for it. You're you know, built, you know, your hair, everything is what I'm looking for. Uh, read the script. If you don't like anything, you know, we can change it, um, which never happened. First thing I did, I just flipped through, you know, is there enough scenes here that looks like I'll be able to pull out, you know, some good footage as an actor to show an agent. And it looked like there was enough action scenes with guns and this and that. I was a little hesitant because it was a martial arts film, and um, he had said, you know, uh, don't worry about the samurai, because I said, I don't know anything about samurai, this and that. If I was going to hold a sword, and you know, be the samurai cop. I just told him. I said, "That's not me." He says, "Don't worry. I'll, you know, I'll have someone there, and you'll, you'll, you'll be fine." Which wasn't the case. I look like Errol Flynn in a swashbuckling movie. But Mark and I pulled up, and there's a guy that's um, off slathering and or lathering himself in some fire retardant. And we're like, what's going on? And he says, oh, here you will, um, he will catch fire and you will put him out. And Mark's looking at me like, 
We're in the middle of like the San Fernando Valley. It's like middle of the summer, everything could probably catch fire. There's no ambulance, there's no fire department, there's nothing. And I'm just, I, I naively just thought, all right, the guy must be a stuntman and he knows what he's doing. But all we had was this little, this little fire extinguisher you saw. Um, and he just said, I'll, I'll say action. And then um, the guy told us, he goes, um, I, I think he said, I'll give a signal or something and then, then you can spray me down or something like that. But, and, and that actual scene, the, the take that you see, it was one take. Um, we cover him with a blanket, and and I think when Mark lifted it, he was still uh, still on fire a little bit. So, but uh, I don't know. I didn't realize how dangerous that was at the time, especially for that guy. I mean, if we didn't put him out, or if the thing didn't malfunction, I mean, the guy's toast. So, it, just crazy. That's just guerrilla filmmaking at its best, and that's classic Amir Shavan, just just doing something to get a good shot. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jennifer. Happy birthday to you. You thought of everything. Well, you can't have a birthday without a cake. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there are a lot, I don't know a lot, maybe it just felt like a lot of the, these really long, um, uncomfortable sex scenes, um, which I think is maybe a hallmark of bad uh, self-indulgent movies. The sex scenes, they don't really tell us anything about the characters who are in them. They're not creating a bond. They're not trying to tell us about chemistry. They're just kind of there because that's what the director felt needed to be there. Janice was a sweet girl, real pretty, but I, I enjoyed those, but not <laughs> to the point where it became with, you know, a mirror, oh, touch her slow, kiss her. There's also that scene in which the action sequence doesn't really have a resolution. It goes into, in one of the, the famous sex scenes from this movie that really don't mean anything. It's just, I think, another thing that the director thought, this is what American movies have. It's something may certainly be awkward for viewers, but it's not something atypical for um, an exploitation film. In that, exploitation films are there to provide a vehicle for um, material like action uh, or sex or sexuality, nudity, that kind of thing um, that viewers come to expect. So really it depends on the way you look at it. Um, looking at this as a, a conventional film, you'll find that uh, those, scenes, those scenes seem gratuitous. However, if you look at it as an exploitation film, you'll find that it delivers on what the audience uh, would expect to see. Is that him? I guess so. Looks like this is his last fuck. Let him finish it then. Hell, I will. We pretty much finished most of the film by November of 90, and I think we came back for maybe two weeks for some filler shots. And Amir says, okay, we're done, Matt, thank you. Uh, I've got everything I need. I'll call you in a few months when I have tape for you. So I said, okay, thanks. Um, and then I had met with my agent and she says, why don't you cut your hair short now? Because, you know, they're not making Tarzan 5 or Son of Rambo. <laughs> Tried to get a different look. So I cut my hair, you know, really short. Um, and then Amir called me in, I think it was January, first part of January. Can you come to the office? I thought, oh great, I get to see what kind of film footage. So I walk in and he flips out. What have you done? You have ruined my film. And I go, what are you talking about? He goes, you cut your hair, we have more to film. I said, you told me we were through. No, I have some more scenes, and I'm thinking, oh man, and I, I mean, I kind of felt bad, but didn't, because I'm thinking, dude, this has to end sometime. So he says, come with me, and we jump in his little car, and we ran to Hollywood Boulevard, and, and Hollywood and Vine was a wig shop, and he just walks me in, and he starts looking around, and he grabs the first wig that he thinks looks like my hair, which was a Jacqueline Smith. It was too curly, it wasn't like mine. But he's like, puts it on my head, and he's, this will be fine, and I'm thinking, oh my God. And at that point, I thought, okay, maybe it's just from some distance, you know, it's not gonna be a big deal. But as you see in the movie, he has tight shots. And it's like from me coming around a corner with my real hair to me looking, it's a wig back to my hair, just all kinds of continuity. So again, that adds to the hilarity of this movie now as a cult film. But I was in fight scenes, which you see there with me and Gerald, and he, <laughs> You see it come off and then you can really see how short my hair was, but um, just ridiculous. And I'm thinking, I can't, there's no way this thing's ever gonna be seen. It's just amazing how many scenes that he did not have, even at that juncture, nine months later, that we were still filming that, that, that had me in that wig. Yeah.
Mark Frazier, I don't think we filmed his um, reaction shots at the same time of that day, but later in the day, Amir was uh, I mean, notorious again for, he'd say, oh, Mark, come here, stand here, look at the camera, um, laugh. And Mark had no reference. W what is this for? You know, what's the context? Um, so then he would say to him, you know, give a reaction shot. And that's why Mark would do his, you know, bug eyes and, you know, the whole thing that he did. One thing that stood out to me was Mark Fraser's reactions, uh, which were clearly divorced from uh, the scene in which they were um, associated with in the edit. Taking out of context, it looks like Mark's a horrible actor, but to be fair, it was just those kind of um, uh, little insert shots that Amir would do, and we even did some in his office. But that was how Amir shot. It was very, let's shoot what I got today. We're gonna take three weeks off. I'll look at the dailies. Then I'll find out what I'm missing, get some more money for film, call the guys back. So this whole thing took from June of 90 to um, January of 91 to film. On its own, the film will have uh... I think that on its own, the film would have very little legacy. Um, it's not particularly memorable in the enormous trash bin of uh, cheap exploitation films, except that it has been preserved and ennobled by those fans of the film who consider it bad enough to warrant some special love. It's really interesting, um, an Iranian filmmaker made a movie of what he thought Americans talk like. And I think that is probably the more interesting way to look at it. I feel like somebody stuck a big club up my ass and it hurts. I've got to figure out a way to get it out of there. It's really interesting to see how he thinks Amer or thought Americans talked and discussed. And I think that's kind of one of the more charming and forgivable things that about this movie because the dialogue is so bad. I mean, as far as the legacy of this movie in particular, there's certainly like a larger culture around so bad they're good movies now. I mean, the fact that we've got, you know, a high profile movie like The Disaster Artist about the making of The Room means obviously there's interest. So I think the legacy of this movie is being sort of swept up along with movies like The Room and Birdemic and Troll 2 and any other uh, films like that, that, that people who have an affinity for, for trash cinema will sit down with their friends and, and joke about it or whatever, or uh, make a documentary about it. Um, you know, the drinking games, anytime you see Matt in the wig, you take a shot, and you know, just funny things. And, and like I said, traveling the world, when I went to Madrid, Spain, I was invited over there to a film festival, and they showed the, uh, we premiered the sequel there in, in Madrid. Uh, they played the first movie first in the theater, full packed theater, and they're just yelling things out in, you know, Spanish, I don't understand what it is, but it's just hilarious. So that to me is fun to watch. And um, I don't think there's anything you can take out of it. Like I've said, film students, I guess, watch it to realize how not to make a movie or, or uh, but, but nowadays, anybody that can get a movie done, of course, with, you know, anybody can grab a phone and make a movie. Um, to get a movie done and out there is quite a task. And so I give kudos to anybody that even, that tries to do it. Uh, getting finance for a movie, next to impossible. But to just go out and make movies in the same vein that, that Amir did, that's the best thing. Uh, if you're a filmmaker, you love to do it. Uh, but capturing lightning in a bottle like we did here is just is very rare, and, and I'm, I'm thankful to be part of that if that's my legacy. Where's her father? Bang! Killed? Who shot him? He. Who? Him. Who's him? Himself. Oh, he committed suicide. Yes! <laughs> I like cops. My cousin's a cop. Oh, really? Where? In Costa Rica. Oh. Good. What's your name? Alfonso Rafael Federico Sebastian. This is my first name. Look out, Joe! 
I will bring you his head and I will place it on your piano. I know the real samurai is here. And uh, you have this stuffed lion's head hanging there. And, you, and it catches your eye pretty quickly when they walk into the scene. In no way we go under Ujiyama's flag. You did it! The job's done. Where are you going? I'm going to a party. Bingo. 